Hey, hello everybody. Um, sorry, uh, hey, every single stream I think I've made a mistake so far. Uh, stream I think I've made a mistake. I reused the template and I reused the template. I made a mistake. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I reused the template. I reused the template and I Oh, okay. I have it. I have it. The, the stream going there. Hopefully, the audio should be better now. <laughs> Was that scary? Sorry, everybody. Okay, should be much better now. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we'll let everybody uh, filter in here. I'll give them a few minutes. How's everybody doing? Okay. Um, hopefully everybody's everybody's um, gonna make it in here. Yeah, I don't know why that screwed up. Uh, it pissed me off. Um, I'm doing just I'm just you're just fine, retard. Um, <laughs> don't mean to call you a retard. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like uh, we're we're caught in such a weird time in history right now. It's been a, it's been a fun one to. Just hold on. Uh, yeah, what's up, Nikolai? Um, it it will be a little bit depressing. It will be a little bit depressing. Not gonna lie. It's one of his bleaker pieces, I guess. So how does everybody feel about um, protests going on right now? Does anybody think it's uh, it's actually going to lead to real systemic change, or is it just going to get cracked down on? It's been sort of impressive so far, just how much momentum they've managed to keep up. Okay, we're just going to get right into it. Hopefully some people uh, have joined. Cat95, every day seems different. It really does. I mean, seems like every day you wake up and you, you have something new to try to digest. That's why I think theory, too, is it's, should come back in a, in a big way if, if we're smart. Because we, we need to try to figure this stuff out, right? We haven't... We haven't much idea of how to process a lot of the stuff that's going on right now. And I'm stuck in Canada, so I mean these protests are across the border. They're pretty... I'm, I'm way over in limbo. Okay, so let's get into the lecture. That was a few minutes. Hopefully some people popped in. <clears throat> Hauntology by Mark Fisher. 1. The Sound of Hauntology. Conjecture. Hauntology has an intrinsically sonic dimension. The pun, hauntology, ontology, works in spoken French, after all. In terms of sound, hauntology is a question of hearing what is not here, the recorded voice, the voice no longer the guarantor of presence. E&P, quote, where does the singer's voice go when it is erased from the dub track? Quote, Not phonocentrism, but phonography. Sound coming to occupy the displace of writing. Nothing here but us recordings. 2. Ghosts of the Real 
Derrida's neologism uncovers the space between being and nothingness. The Shining, both in book and film versions, and here I suggest sidestepping of the wearisome struggle between King fans and Kubrickians, and propose treating the novel and the film as a labyrinth rhizome, a set of interlocking correspondences and differences, a row of doors, it is about what lurks, unquiet in that space. Insofar as they continue to frighten us once we've left the cinema, the ghosts that dwell here are not supernatural. As with Vertigo, in The Shining, it is only when the possibility of supernatural spooks have been laid to rest that we can confront the real ghosts, or the ghosts of the real. 3. The Haunted Ballroom Mark Sinker, quote, All Kubrick's films are fantastically listenable, if you use this in the same sort of sense you use watchable. Unquote. Where does... The conceit of the caretaker's memories from the haunted ballroom has the simplicity of genius. A whole album's worth of songs that you might have heard playing in the gold room in the Shining's Overlook Hotel. Memories from the haunted ballroom is a series of soft focus, delirial, oneric versions of 20s and 30s tea room pop tunes. The original numbers drenched in so much reverb that they have dissolved into a suggestive audio fog. The songs all the more evocative now that they have been reduced to hints of themselves. Thus Al Boley's It's All Forgotten Now, for instance, one of the tracks actually used by Kubrick on the Shining soundtrack, is slurred down, faded in and out, as if it is being heard in the ethereal wireless of the dreaming mind, or played in the winding down gramophone of memory. As Ian Penman wrote of Dub, quote, It makes of the voice not a self-possession, but a dispossession, a repossession by the studio, detoured through hidden circuits of the recording console, unquote. The singer's voice. Go. 4. In the Gold Room. Jameson. Quote, it is by the twenties that the hero is haunted and possessed. Unquote. Kubrick's editing of the film does not allow any of the polyvalences of that phrase, it's all forgotten now, to go unremarked. The uncanniness of that song, today and 25 years ago when the film was released, arises from the false but unavoidable impression that it is commenting on itself and its period as if it were an example of the way in which that era of beautiful and damned decadence and gatsby glamour were painfully delightfully aware of its own butterfly wing evanescence and fragility simultaneously the song's place in the film it plays in the background as a bewildered jack speaks to grady in the bathroom about the fact that grady has killed himself after brutally murdering his children indicates that what is forgotten may also be preserved through the mechanism of repression. I don't have any recollection of that at all. Why does this gold room pop, all those moonlight serenades and summer romances, have such power? The caretaker's spectralized versions of those lost tunes only intensifies something that Kubrick, like Dennis Potter, had identified in the pop of the 20s and 30s. I've tried to write before about the particular aching quality of those songs that are melancholy even at their most ostensibly joyful, forever condemned to stand in for states that they can evoke but never instantiate. For Friedrich Jameson, the Gold Room Revels bespeak a nostalgia for, quote, the last moment in which a genuine American leisure class led an aggressive and ostentatious public existence, in which an American ruling class projected a class consciousness and unapologetic image of itself and enjoyed its privileges without guilt, openly and armed with emblems of top hats and champagne glasses on the social stage in full view of the other classes." End quote. But the significance of this genteel, conspicuous hedonism must be constructed psychoanalytically as well as merely historically. The past here is not an actual historical period so much as a phantasmatic past, a time that can only ever be retrospectively, retrospectrally, posited. The haunted ballroom functions in Jack's libidinal economy, to borrow a neologism from Irigaray, as the place of belonging in which, impossibly, the demands of both the paternal and maternal superegos can be met. The honeyed, dreamy utopia where doing his duty would be equivalent to enjoying himself. Thus, after his conversations with the bartender, Lloyd and waiter Grady, 
Jack's frustrations finding a blandly indulgent blank mirror sounding board in the former and a patrician patriarchal voice in the latter. Jack becomes to believe that he would be failing in his duty as a man and father if he didn't succumb to his desire to kill his wife and child. White man's burden, Lloyd. White man's burden. If the gold room seems to be a male space, it's no accident that the conversation with Grady takes place in the men's room, the place in which Jack, via male intermediaries, intercesses working on behalf of the hotel management, the house, the house that pays for his drinks, faces up to his man's burdens. It is also the space in which he can succumb to the injunction of the maternal superego. Enjoy. Michael Simmont, quote, when Jack arrives at the Overlook, he describes the sensation of familiarity, of well-being. It's very homey, he would say, like to stay here forever. He confesses even to having never been this happy or comfortable anywhere, refers to a sense of deja vu, and has the feeling that he has been here before. When someone dreams of a locality or a landscape, according to Freud, and while one's dreaming thinks, I know this, I've been here before, one is authorized to interpret that place as substituting for the genital organs and the maternal body. Unquote. 5. Patriarchy Ontology Isn't Freud's thesis, first advanced in Totem and Taboo, and then repeated, with a difference, in Moses and Monotheism, simply this? Patriarchy is a ontology. The father, whether obscene alpha ape par jouissance of Totem and Taboo, or the severe, forbidden patriarch of Moses and monotheism, is inherently spectral. In both cases, the father is murdered by his resentful children who want to retake Eden and access total enjoyment. Their father's blood is on their hands, and the children discover, too late, that total enjoyment is not possible. Now, stricken by guilt, they found that their dead father survives, in the mortification of their own flesh, and in the interjected voice which demands its deadening. 6. A History of Violence Simmet, quote, The camera itself, with its forward, lateral, and reverse tracking shots, following a rigorously geometric circuit, adds further to this sense of implacable logic and almost mathematical progression. Unquote. Even before he enters the Overlook, Jack is fleeing his ghosts. And the horror, the absolute horror, is that he, the haunter and the haunted, flees to the place where they are waiting. Such is The Shining's pitiless fatality, and the novel is anything if not more brutal in its diagramming of the network of cause and effect, the awful necessity, the generalized determinism, of Jack's plight than the film. Jack has a history of violence. In both novel and film of The Shining, the Torrance family is haunted by the prospect that Jack will hurt Danny. Again. Jack has already snapped, drunkenly attacked Danny, an aberration, a miscalculation. Quote, a momentary loss of muscular coordination, a few extra pounds of energy per second, per second. Unquote. So Jack tries to convince Wendy, and Wendy tries to convince herself. The novel tells us more. How has it come to this, that a proud man, an educated man like Jack, is reduced to sitting there, false, greasy grin plastered over his face, sucking up everything the smarmy corporate non-entity like Stuart Ullman serves up. Why? Because he has been sacked from his teaching job for attacking a pupil, of course. That is why Jack will accept, and be glad of, Ullman's menial job in the Overlook. The history of violence goes back even further. One of the things missing from the film but dealt with at some length in the novel is the account of Jack's relationship with his father. It's another version of patriarchy's occult history, now not so secret. Abuse begetting abuse. Jack is to Danny as Jack's father was to him, and Danny will be to his child. The violence has been passed on, like a virus. It's already inside Jack, like a photograph waiting to develop, a recording waiting to be played. Refrain. Refrain. 7. Home is where the haunt is. The word haunt and all the derivations thereof may be one of the closest English words to the German Unheimlich, whose polysemic connotations and etymological echoes Freud so assiduously and so famously unraveled in his essay The Uncanny. 
just as German usage allows for the familiar Das Heimlich, the homely, to switch to its opposite, the uncanny, Das Unheimlich, the unhomely. So haunt signifies both the dwelling place, the domestic scene, and that which so disturbs or invades it. The OED lists one of the earliest meanings of the word haunt as to provide a home, house. Fittingly, then, the best interpretations of the shining position it between the melodrama and horror, much as Cronenberg's history of violence is positioned between melodrama and the action film. In both cases, the worst things, the real horror, is already inside. And what could be worse than that? You would never hurt mommy or me, would ya? 8. The house always wins. What horrors does the big, looming house present? For the women of horror drama, it is threatened in non-being, either because the woman will be unable to differentiate herself from the domestic space, or because, as in Rebecca, itself an echo of Jane Eyre, she will be unable to take the place of a spectral predecessor. Either way, she has no access to the proper name. Jack's curse, on the other hand, is that he is nothing but the carrier of the patronym, and everything he does will have always been the case. I'm sorry to differ with you, sir, but you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know. I've always been here. 9. I'm right behind you, Danny. Metz. When Jack chases Danny into the maze with an axe in hand and states, I'm right behind you, Danny. He is predicting Danny's future as well as he is trying to scare the boy. Predicting Danny's future, Jack might be, but that is why he could equally as well say, I'm just ahead of you, Danny. Danny may have physically escaped Jack, but psychically? The Shining leaves us with the awful suspicion that Danny may become his daddy, that the damage has already been done. The photograph has already been taken, the recording made. All that is left is the moment of development, of playing back. Unmask. And how does Danny escape from Jack? By walking backwards in his father's footsteps. 10. The No Time of Trauma. Jack. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here. I recognize you. I saw your picture in the newspapers. You, uh, chopped your wife and your daughters up into little bits, and then you blew your brains out. Grady. That's strange, sir. I don't have any recollection of that at all. What is the time when Jack meets Grady? It seems that the murder and suicide has already happened. Grady tells Jack that he had to correct his daughters. Yet, not surprisingly, Grady has no memory. Bowley's it's all forgotten now, wafting in the background. Of any such events. I don't have any recollection of that at all. And you think, well, it's not the sort of thing you'd forget, killing yourself and your children, is it? But of course, it's not the sort of thing you could possibly remember. It is an exemplary case of that which must be repressed, the traumatic real. Jack, Mr. Grady, you are the caretaker here. Grady, I'm sorry to differ with you, sir, but you are the caretaker. You have always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. 11. Overlooked. Overlook. To look over or at from a high place. To fail to notice or consider. Miss. Okay. <clears throat> so that was a shorter piece um, that Mark Fisher wrote. I hope you've all seen The Shining. It's sort of a classic film, so I assume at least everybody's familiar with it. Uh, there's a lot going on in this short paper, though. A lot. So uh, we'll kind of take a little bit of time to go through some of the ideas um, that he talks about but he doesn't necessarily flesh out as much he kind of just puts them to work uh, he starts uh, or he doesn't actually start but um, the earliest thinker in this sort of uh, genealogy is Freud here so he talks about uh, the uncanny uh, das Heimlich. I'm going to be saying that wrong I know I have at least one German speaker in the audience who's cringing right now <clears throat> it's typically translated as the uncanny uh, so what what Freud was trying to do in his paper, The Uncanny, on The Uncanny, he was trying to take aesthetic theory and apply it into 
um, psychology, right? So aesthetic theory, it's typically a philosophical thing. It's related uh, to beauty, right? Uh, what makes something beautiful? What he wants to do is instead look at aesthetic theory in a psychological sense based on feelings. So how he's going to analyze this sort of aesthetic sense of feeling is through the word Heimlich and Unheimlich. Uh, it's a German word. It translates a couple different ways. We're going we're gonna to get into that. So uh, Heimlich could be homey, comfortable, uh, intimate. It could also be something which is like secret, hidden, or concealed. It's uh, uh, something about like being private or um, some, some, somewhere around, like uh, something like that. I think the most common uh, interpretation of the word would be secret, but uh, I, I don't speak German. So <laughs> this is just me talking to, to people who know more than I do. Uh, Unheimlich, uh, the word unhomey, it's not actually, as far as I know, part of like the German colloquial understanding of the word. Uh, it's it's much more like a direct literal translation. So eerie, uncanny would probably be the better translation. And I don't think it means revealed or unhidden. I think that was another thing that Freud was trying to pull out. So what he's really trying to do is explore this this definition between this, this comfortable, homey feeling and this uncomfortable, uh, eerie, uncanny feeling. But he's also tying that into these these weird secondary meanings that the feelings have of um, homey being hidden and unhomey, uh, un unfamiliar being being uh, revealed. So this was a slide I found somewhere discussing um, the definitions and how they kind of play into one another. I thought this was a useful almost mapping to look at because it it shows how there's almost like this this network of of connotations that Freud is trying to draw out and uh, contrast against one another. And it creates this weird like uh, like web almost. So Freud's definition of the uncanny, uh, the uncanny is that class of the frightening which leads back to that which is uh, known of old and is long familiar. He draws this from Schelling's definition of Unheimlich, uh, which he says is the name for everything which uh, everything that ought to have remained secret and hidden but has come to light. So what, what might be thought of here is like a ghost story, a, a, like The Shining, right? Uh, in Heimlich, uh, it's, it's, at least in the Schelling Freud definition, it's this weird idea of something which was hidden, but at the same time becomes revealed, right? So in the psychoanalytic terminology, how Freud puts this, the uncanny is in reality nothing new or alien, but something which is familiar and old established in the mind, which has become alienated uh, from it only through the process of repression. So that's that's where he wants to draw Heimlich and Unheimlich away from the colloquial definitions and towards this more psychological understanding between um, sort of the hidden things becoming revealed, which is a very uncomfortable feeling, and the more comfortable feeling we're used to, which is sort of built upon all these hidden, concealed things that we kind of keep out of sight. Uh, this is a, a quote here. Um, what interests us is to find that among the different shades of meaning which the word unheimlich exhibits, one which is identical with its opposite, unheimlich, uh, what is heimlich thus comes to be unheimlich. Thus heimlich is a word, the meaning of which develops towards an ambivalence until it finally coincides with its opposite, unheimlich. Unheimlich is in some way or another a subspecies of heimlich. So this is where, uh, and I think it's heimlich, I think I'm saying this terribly wrong by the way but I, I'm accepting that at this point um, so it's it's uh, this is Freud too from his essay so it's 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 a very strange sort of idea it makes a lot of sense though right I mean think about the the Grady you know murdering his children it's not something you'd forget but at the same time it's not something you can really remember I, there's some things that are so traumatic that it it needs to be repressed in order for us to sort of maintain a psychological continuity and sometimes you know the destruction of that psycho psych continuity however you want to say it it isn't actually bringing in something new but it's 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 reviving the old it's bringing up something that's that's already there that's that's existing previously but just hidden <clears throat> okay long quotes here we go 
In the first place, if psychoanalytic theory is correct in maintaining that every emotional effect, whatever its quality, is transformed by repression into morbid anxiety, then such cases of anxiety there must be a class in which the anxiety can be shown to come from something which repressed, which recurs. This class of morbid anxiety would then be no other than what is uncanny, irrespective of whether it originally aroused dread or some other effect. In the second place, if this is indeed the secret nature of the uncanny, then we can understand why the usage of speech has extended das Heimlich into its opposite das Unheimlich. Uh, for this uncanny is in reality nothing new or foreign, but something familiar and old established in the mind that has been estranged only by the process of repression. This reference to the factor of repression enables us, furthermore, to understand Schelling's definition of the uncanny as something which ought to have been kept concealed, which nevertheless has come to light. So there's a kind of weird, um, a weird play going on here. The technical term is parasimonia. Um, I don't think many people are going to even remember that word. I probably won't after I forget this. It's a pun. Right, that's the the simple ways to think about it is it's a pun. So Heimlich and Heimlich, he's already starting to play on this this weird kind of um, uh, ambiguous meanings of words, which you can use to kind of it's it's like wordplay. Uh, so ontology, right? This uh, works in a, in spoken French as a pun. You can't defend def, distinguish it phonetically from the word ontology. It's ontology and ontology in in French. So when you say ontology, you don't actually know whether they're meaning ontology or hauntology, because ont and ont, it's pronounced the same way in spoken French. Uh, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. So this is what Derrida is going to kind of draw from um, in his, his work, uh, Specters of Marx, where he, he uh, goes into this idea of hauntology. So... It's kind of interesting to note um, that he he interesting. It, it's important to note that he's he's drawing from this, uh, at least for right now. Okay, so this is a quote from Derrida then. Uh, but haunting is historical, to be sure. Uh, but it is never dated. It is never docilely given a date in the chain uh, in the chain of presence day after day, according to the instituted order of a calendar. Untimely, it does not come to be. It does not happen to, it does not befall. One day, Europe, as if the latter, at a certain moment of its history, had begun to suffer from a certain evil, to let itself be inhabited in its inside, that is, to be haunted by a foreign ghost. But there was no inside. There was nothing inside before it. The ghostly would displace itself like the movement of this history. Haunting would mark the very existence of Europe. It would open the space and the relation to self of what is called <clears throat> excuse me what is called by this name at least since the Middle Ages. So this is a kind of uh, it's a very interesting quote to try to process that the name Europe was already connected to this to this ghost that that Marx is pointing at that that Europe itself is only defined sort of in relation to. The, the ghosts which which haunt it so much like jack arrives to a hotel to find that he's always been there marx brings the ghosts of communism to europe to find that they've always been there this haunting isn't the displacement of the inside right it's not an outside ghost taking over it's the very form of of interiority it opens the space in the relation to self uh, of what is called this name as as derrida would have put it okay Is there, between the thing in itself and its simulacrum, uh, an opposition that holds up? Repetition and the first time, but also repetition and the last time, since the singularity of any first time makes it excuse me, also a last time. Each time it is the event itself. A first time is a last time, altogether other. Staging for the end of history. Let us call it hauntology. Hamlet already began with the expected return of a dead king. After the end of history, the spirits come. The spirits comes by coming back, revenant. It figures both a dead man who comes back and a ghost whose expected return repeats itself again and again. He also says, "To haunt does not mean to be present, 
and it is necessary to introduce haunting into the very construction of a concept, of every concept beginning with the concepts of being in time. That is why we would hear, uh, that's why we'd be calling here a hauntology. Ontology opposes it only in a movement of exorcism. Ontology is a conjuration. I think this is a good place to draw the connection between hauntology and virtuality in a Deleuzian sense, because I think there's a lot to be said here. Ghosts, those things which haunt, they have a virtual reality. They don't exist as a positive, actual formation. The becoming actual, the movement that marks sort of the boundary between ontology and hauntology, the, the actualization of the virtual concept, it's both an exorcism and a conjuration. It, it excises it from the realm of ghosts, but in doing so, it conjures it into the real. It un unveils it. It excises the ghost, but it doesn't negate it. It actually brings it into the ontological. And this is how the Heimlich becomes the Umheimlich and the Unheimlich becomes the Heimlich. Ontology becomes ontology, right? It's this, this back and forth kind of movement that um, it's... It, one sort of is always providing the space for the other. Okay, so let's finally drag this back into Fisher. And we're going to do that by uh, reading another very, very long quote. This was a short essay, so I thought it was kind of useful to, to bring in some other quotes to help draw this out. So this next quote is from his essay, uh, Ghosts of My Life, which um, is the, it's the titular essay in the book, which I got the uh, Home is What Haunt is as well. But hauntology explicitly brings into play the question of time in a way that had not been quite the case with trace or difference. One of the most repeated phrases in Spectres of Marx is from Hamlet, the time is out of joint. And in his recent radical atheism, Derrida and the Time of Life, Martin Hagland argues that it is possible to see all of Derrida's work in relation to this concept of broken time. Derrida's aim, Hagland argues, is to, con uh, excuse me, <clears throat> is to formulate a general ontology in contrast to the traditional ontology that thinks being in terms of self-identical presence. What is important about the figure of the specter, then, is that it cannot be fully present. It has no being in itself, but marks the relation to what is no longer or not yet. Is ontology, then, some attempt to revive the supernatural, or is it just a figure of speech? The way out of this unhelpful opposition is to think of ontology as an agency of the virtual with the specter understood not as anything supernatural, but as that which acts without physically existing. The great thinkers of modernity, Freud as well as Marx, had discovered different modes of this spectral causality. The late capitalist world, governed by abstractions of finance, is very clearly a world in which virtualities are effective, and perhaps the most ominous specter of Marx is capital itself. But as Derrida underlines in his interviews in the Ghost Dance film, Psychoanalysis is, also, psychoanalysis is also a science of ghosts, a study of how reverberant events in the psyche become revenants. Referring back to Hagelin's distinction between the no longer and the not yet, we can provisionally distinguish two directions in ontology. The first refers to that which uh, in actuality is no longer, but which remains effective as a virtuality, the traumatic compulsion to repeat, a fatal pattern. The second sense of ontology refers to that which in actuality has not yet happened, but which is already effective in the virtual, an attractor and anticipation shaping current behavior. The specter of communism that Marx and Engels had warned of in the first lines of the Communist Mesto, Manifesto was just this kind of ghost, a virtuality whose threatened coming was already playing a part in undermining the present state of things. So we've explored a little bit and Fisher has certainly explored quite a bit about where our hauntology lies for um, Derrida. But where exactly does hauntology lie for Fisher? I think in a way the essay is itself a bit of an overlook, right? It provides an overlook in the sense that it, uh, it overlooks certain com uh, uh, concepts. It gives you a, a general idea of them. Uh, but it also overlooks the concept itself and that it seems like he's not really saying what he wants to say. There's all this talk of Derrida and Freud and cinema and dub. 
it seems almost like in a sense that Fisher's work isn't really saying anything new. Like he's just kind of roaming the halls of the hotel of Freud and Derrida. But I think in a sense, there's more going on here. Like the specter of Fisher's hauntology, it was in these halls from the beginning. Right, it's hauntology in a way was already marked by what Fisher is talking about here, and this essay is trying to express something which is more or less left unsaid. But let's uh, set that aside for a moment. I want to draw out a little bit more about this, um, the connections between home and haunt, where Freud takes philosophical aesthetics of beauty to psychological aesthetics of feeling. Fisher is sort of going to take Derrida's philosophical account of hauntology, uh, hauntology of being, and put it towards a more psychological hauntology of feelings. So we're not just looking at history or works of philosophy, we're looking at art, we're looking at cinema, music, historical repetitions of course, but ones that are more firmly rooted in the psychological. Uh, it might be said that ghosts haunt places, sure, but ghosts also haunt us as well. This is why Fisher says that the genteel, conspicuous hedonism of the 20s must be construed psychoanalytically as well as merely historically. It is in the Gold Room where Jack comes to find uh, his ego and superego have aligned. So I'm not actually the biggest expert on, on Freud, I'm going to be totally honest with you guys here, but this is uh, just a quick overview, I guess, of, of the difference between um, ego and, and superego. Uh, so, so there's this, this Oedipus complex. Uh, the male realizes he cannot possess his mother because of castration, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, the male comes to internalize the rule of his father as the superego uh, or the moralistic rule side based of the mind. Uh, the ego is, is closer to where conscious desires come into play. So where the superego says, thou shalt not, the ego is more what says, I want. And I think what's really interesting, what um, Fisher draws out here, is that Jack has fallen into this situation where his conscious desires to harm his family, they end up coinciding with his superego, with the moral desire, um, the duty-bound side of him. Grady is, in a real way, representative of this patriarchal element, the restrictive uh, Oedipal father telling, uh, but instead of telling Jack, you know, thou shalt not, he tells Jack to enjoy it. Strangely, Freud doesn't think the same process happens in women. There's something called the electric complex, I think, by which women internalize the mother as the superego. So there is a maternal superego as well. Um, I'm not really sure here. Again, I'm not the biggest Freud expert. Anyways, but it does, it does make sense why uh, Jack and Danny are the ones who are caught into this idea of the patronym, the idea of the proper name of the father. And Wendy, Fisher notes, she's caught in between a completely different paradox between losing herself um, in the domestic space which she now occupies or remaining as sort of that which does not have a name, that which exists without a patronym. So where the, the, the male, Jack, is sort of doomed to a name, the female is uh, doomed to anonymity in a strange way. So, what do we mean by retroactivity? We haven't really teased this out yet, but it's come up quite a bit. Remember in Derrida, the specter of communism, it doesn't enter from the outside, it provided the inside itself, right? Europe has always been a Europe which has been haunted. For Derrida, Marx wasn't some foreign incursion into European history, he was the sorcerer who was conjuring the ghosts out of Europe's soul, so to speak. It might be a bit poetic, but I'm sure you guys will appreciate it. In a way, The Shining complicates all this spectacularly. Retroactivity isn't merely historical, it's genealogical. There's a hidden space, you know, the soul, which supports the name of the father. And in Jack's case, it's abuse. It's already there. It's 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 laid in advance. It is behind. It is the no longer of childhood, but it is also the not yet of fatherhood. It exists in that in that spectral way of something which has both happened and disappeared and is going to happen. And by the end of the film, this is why we believe the picture has been taken. The abuse for Danny is it has become a no longer, right? He's left his father behind. But remember, this was Jack for a time too. Jack escaped his father as well. 
that doesn't mean that the positions haven't been reversed, that Jack isn't just ahead of Danny. So retroactivity, recursivity, time loops, all those sorts of things, they all mimic this notion of parasnomonia, of, of uh, parasnomonia, sorry, paranomasia. I, th I think that's how I say it probably, paranomasia, uh, a pun, right? So with a pun, you hear the punchline in the opening, right? The end of the joke is simply the revelation which allows you to understand that which you have already heard. Reading the setup is taking the picture and getting to the end of the, the joke is you just develop that picture which had the punchline on it the whole time. Take my wife, please, right? The punchline is, 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 it's not really saying please, right? All please does is retroactively allow you to understand the setup. That take my wife wasn't uh, an example; it was a command, <laughs> and and that's all. Uh, that's the the real crux of retroactivity here that I think we can we can draw from. It's this idea that it already existed in the past. It simply comes to light through uh, through the process of, of time, or or however you want to look at it. Uh, there's almost this distinction of, of microcosmic time being out of joint in a pun, right? A pun in itself is this miniature retroactive... Uh, it's a microcosm in a, in a weird way. It's, it's, a, it's a very localized way of playing with this weird idea of retroactivity where something happens and then changes in the future. The past changes in the future. So, looking at puns looking at all these sorts of things. Consider all the consistent use of puns in the Fisher essay. Sure, I'm sure we all got overlook in section 11, right? Um, to overlook something, to miss, to fail, to consider. Uh, another good one here is revenant. Um, revenant in uh, French means to remember, uh, to recall, something like that. But in... Um, in English, it means, well, I mean, it, it, colloquially, it means a ghost. Some, something that has come back from the dead, like a, a ghost or a zombie or something like that. I don't know if it has that same play in French, but there is an interesting pun going on there as well. And there's another really interesting one uh, that comes up, refrain. They say refrain, refrain. And again, very easy to pass these things over, but when you start thinking about it, a refrain it's what does it mean to refrain means to stop to resist but what is a refrain a refrain is something which repeats which comes about again so refrain again it not only contains this this pun this this retroactivity but it explains the retroactivity in in this weird way too uh, a ghost is always refraining but at the same time a ghost is always a refrain it is both the no longer right the ref it is refrained and it is not yet as it is a refrain which is to come about again so in this sense like was fisher conjuring his own ghosts like when you hear the word hauntology now in a weird sense where like for example the pun in ontology ontology worked in in french we now have a new ambiguity between hauntology as Derrida meant it and hauntology as Fisher meant it. So in a weird way, hauntology itself develops this own ambiguous parasimonic double meaning where no longer is the uh, word hauntology understandable simply phonetically, right? It, it, it develops that same interior uh, ghost-like quality which Derrida tried to give it in the French. So where Derrida was constructing phonocentrism, or should I say, where Derrida is deconstructing phonocentrism, the false univoc univocal sort of element of the word, Fisher is deconstructing phonography, the repetition of psychological recordings. For Derrida, there are specters all around us, in the words we speak, in the places we live. For Derrida, or excuse me, for Fisher, the specters are abound in words and places, but they live and breathe through us, in us, through trauma through repression human history refrain refrain so yeah i think there's this there's this bizarre sort of uh 
underplay, this undercurrent that's going on in what Fisher's doing, where he's really trying to draw out these this distinction in ontology that didn't quite exist in in Derrida. And in doing so, he complicates the whole thing and brings it into this new, greater, uh, more, uh, more, quite honestly, a little bit deeper um, of an approach to ontology, which can not only understand things historically, um, but past uh, that element into the in individual, into the psychological, through repression, through mechanisms of, of a patriarchy, of patronyms. And that's about all I have. So that is uh, concludes our third and final Fisher lecture. I'm so glad you guys were all here with me. I'm gonna go up and we're gonna read some uh, some questions now. Let's see. Vermo Dog says, "I think I read this in Ghosts of My Life." Yes, this was um, from Ghosts of My Life. Uh, which is a bit of a it's an interesting book for sure there's a lot going on in there but so much of it is music and stuff I find it a little bit difficult to read sometimes but this essay in particular really spoke to me I thought it was really said something worth going over uh, watcher says I like the wide view I like all the wide views in the shining I'm assuming you mean like camera wise because yeah it's it's very a, a lot of horror films try to focus on claustrophobia but I think The Shining does this really good job of every room they're in is so massive. It's so much bigger than they are which I, I think it also plays into that weird idea of you know history looming over you and stuff like that for sure. Vermo Dog says that class of terrifying which leads us back to something long known to us once very familiar. Yeah yeah it's an interesting uh heimlich and and in heimlich is is an interesting one i had a lot of fun learning about that researching this essay for sure i've got a big uh freud reader sitting on my desk that i've barely barely chipped the surface of so it was a good excuse to break that open Uh, uh, someone with a Russian name says, God damn it, I have to, uh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, for anybody who was here expecting it to be starting at 2, it was a mistake on, on the way the YouTube's template system works, I guess, I don't know, I'm not going to use templates again, it didn't work. Uh, Verma Dog says, Heig Unheig, I'm probably pronouncing that totally wrong. Danish Norwegian conveys a similar notation as Heimlich and Heimlich. Interesting, interesting. Is it is it also that same, um, like Heig, I'm probably saying that totally wrong. Is that both like homely and hidden? Or is it just the homely, unhomely kind of distinction? And apparently unhomely isn't even a good translation. It was Freud being like super kind of literal about it. Most people when they hear the word in Heimlich wouldn't think of, of um, unhomely. Unhomey or whatever, however, however you want to say it. I think unhomely, I think that would mean like unugly. I don't know. Keithy Brin Brinson says, go update the firmware in the snowcat and the radio. Go update. That's a shining joke guy says love this asmr is this asmr is, am i have an asmr channel i'm okay with that if, if that's what my lectures are i found out i'm an e-boy e too so i'm an e-boy asmr channel so I'm, I'm learning so much about myself doing these lectures i have to say uh keithy brinson the gypsy's wife we've haunted by world war ii and since have created a police state the gypsies we are haunted by <laughs> world war ii since created a police state over my head. I don't get the gypsy reference. I'm not European enough to get it, I think. Another name says, what is the next videos? So this is my thought is just to basically disappear. <laughs> just like stop posting videos and get my act together and just focus full time on the part three 
do the teleoplexy video. I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about that though. Whether I should just fuck off for a few weeks and and work on that. Cause like I, I feel bad when I disappear for a long time for you guys, you know. I mean I know like I have, I have Patreon supporters. Like I've you guys mean a lot to me. And yeah, I wanna I wanna continue making content on like a regular basis so you guys aren't just you know constantly checking my channel just to see no videos but at the same time i do actually want to work on these big projects and get them done and it's very hard to do that unless you can kind of just set aside your life so i don't know um i'd be interested to hear what you guys think about that how watcher asked how am i an e-boy uh Apparently, I made the video where I was making jambalaya and talking about Spinoza, and that 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 was all it took. Apparently, I'm an e-boy now. Debate in the comments whether I'm an e-boy. Watcher says, oh, another name is, is supporting me in, in disappearing for a few weeks and working on part three. So that's, that's kind of nice. I feel bad, but I feel like at the same time, I'm, I'm depriving you guys of a video that you, you are going to get eventually, right? Watcher says, maybe I didn't listen closely enough, but the haunt aspect feels just like some kind of persistence, maybe an eerie persistence, but still. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, uh, he even mentioned something that haunt like the earliest sort of english understand like english i think it means english at least uh the oed definition of haunt was to provide a home for something which i mean persistence and like to for something to have a home i think kind of plays into well well uh plays well into one another neo would be fine with me disappearing for a couple weeks that's good yeah i kind of had this last little bit of quarantine too before i'm sure everything starts back up and i got to get back to real the real world so i do still have a little bit of time i can actually dedicate to it which might be nice um keithy am i saying that right keithy i keep wanting to say kathy but it's definitely not kathy keithy brinson uh says drinks and avocados <laughs> maybe i'm missing that joke uh james white a few weeks of quiet for tealy pecs would be well worth it okay it's it's a it's going to be a big one. It's already so out of hand and it's like, it feels like I've barely started. Like I have, right? It's, it's just, it's all so uncollected right now. It's all just in different pieces and parts and some notes are written on paper and some are on like little scraps of paper and some are on like, some are like literally like my, notes I was taking like six months ago that I, were like on a scrap of paper that were written, uh, and just shoved into a binder somewhere. Like I have so much just like groundwork done, but I need to put it all together. Uh, yeah. Watch her disappear and come back spooky. Yeah. It's, it's going to be very hauntological. Uh, another name says maybe you should create a discord channel to keep some. S s okay. So, so I do have a discord channel, but it's not like my discord channel. It's just like accelerationism. So it's not really a good place to keep up with like what I'm doing. If you want to keep up with what I'm doing, like, directly, I do have an Aldous Huxley, uh, uh, excuse me, Discord channel, but it's only for Patreon people right now. Whether that, like, would change in the future, like, whether Patreon people would maybe get, like, a special role, and I could open up to, like, a bigger, um, bigger group of people or something like that, and then, I don't know. I, I need to figure out some way to, like, Make sure that the Patreon people are still uh, given their due. I feel like I need to do more for my Patreon people. I, I do feel bad about that. If any, if any of you are out there listening, shouts out to you guys. You're my heroes. S. Grosh says, "Will you do a video that goes deep into contrasting dialectics and deterritorialization?" Yeah, I could do that. I've written a paper on it. See, this is one of the the issues. It's not exactly an issue in anything other than like my own personal 
this is my own super ego, I guess. But I tried to keep this channel a little bit separate from like my writing per se. So like on this channel, I mostly talk about like other people's ideas and a lot of like what my sort of like personal interest has been like trying to do some more original philosophy has been in sort of the intersection between uh, dialectics and accelerationism or uh, differential ontology or uh, libidinal materialism or however you want to however you want to draw that stuff so I feel like I, I'm almost bordering into like I would start I would start talking about my ideas rather than other people's ideas which I don't know if I want to turn that the, this channel into that it's kind of it's kind of nice to have this channel be kind of pure and not have to worry about my thoughts as much Uh, Nia says it's not officially discord for his channel yeah so the discord and I guess now that I'm talking about it again I'll link it in this video too it's just a place to talk about accelerationism it's not it's not like an Aldous Huxley accelerationist discord or anything like that the only Aldous Huxley accelerationist discord is currently for patreons only Watcher says, I just checked into the SpaceX stream where they managed to have liftoff 20 minutes ago. Watcher says, there's also chat, but only those who make donations are known. Which is funny because it can be only made to make it harder to post. You won't need the money. There's also chat, but only those who make donations are shown. Oh, for the, for the SpaceX thing, right? Yeah, I don't think they need the donations, that's for sure. <laughs> another name really wants in okay uh, i'll talk to the patreon people i'll uh, my 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 patreons are are uh they would be the ones i'd need to go to and, and discuss that with but that might be something we could do so like there'd be like a, a role where if you're a patreon member you get like you know special you get you get bonuses or whatever and then um there would just be like a a lower class right i'd set up a very strict class society right off the bat watcher says let the right one in spooky let the right one in is a really good movie did they remake that or is it just the the original foreign one from scandinavia or wherever watch the original that's a really good movie if they remade it i don't know i haven't seen it don't watch it Uh, guy question mark asks what do you feel the general praxis behind accelerationism consists of I feel there isn't a general praxis behind accelerationism um, there are Marxist accelerationists there are right-wing accelerationists there are anarchist accelerationists there are uh, you know collapse accelerationists there are like you know de-accelerationists de people who just want to slow stuff down i think that like accelerationism is it's easier to understand as like um as a descriptive theory that people use to justify their own praxis very rarely do people like come into accelerationism and actually change their political leanings like that's something i've 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 noticed pretty significantly like if you're a right winger and you get into accelerationism, you just kind of apply accelerationism to right wing. You don't tend to like, uh, kind of like, change your your larger political leanings. At least that's what I. It seems to me, at least, everybody just tacks the sort of descriptive element of accelerationism onto their political leanings. Now that might not be the right thing to do. Like maybe there are more praxis you could draw out of it, right? But I feel like. The skip, but like they, 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 the accelerationist community tends to skip that step between theory and praxis. They tend to just use that theory to support whatever praxis they feel like. Uh, another name asks, uh, so could you link your writing somewhere? If you guys go to my Twitter, I like all my writings are in a collection, just sitting there on a pinned comment right at the very top. It's the collection called uh, "At the End of the Theater." It's just a bunch of essays and some fiction. 
It's 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 there's a couple good, worthwhile pieces in there, but it's you know it's what it's what it is. It's just a collection of old writings. S. Grosh says, "Wait until you're an established philosopher." <laughs> yeah, uh, you guys are more optimistic about that than I am. I have to say. Watcher says, uh, I try not to get too many people into the chat, or at least not too low of a barrier. Uh, the ACT channel already grew too fast in two, two weeks ago. The ACT channel, um, the, the growth, a lot of it didn't seem to come from the video. Like, about, like, probably half of it came from a video, and half of it actually came from me linking it in another Discord server. Um, the nice thing about the the little uh, expansion of that server was like it was pretty high quality as far as like the posts remained it didn't just devolve into like non-accelerationist you know whatever it, it it remained it remained on topic as long as we're remaining on topic on that server i don't really care it was already so slow like we needed something to kick it in the butt rewarding for money is capitalist though yeah totally another name totally it's a totally uh hierarchical class imposition that I'm forcing uh, I would be forcing onto the Patreon server just think of me as Stalin that's how you should imagine me just like I call myself a communist but in reality do that state capitalism son Uh, Nikolai says uh, they remade the movie. I only saw the original. The remake is left the right one in. Let me in. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Let the right one in. Left. The, I can't. I, I can't remember exactly what the original. I think it was let let the right one in, wasn't it? It was a. It's a. It's a. I'll look it up right now. I don't want to get this wrong. I think it's a Scandinavian film. Really good. That's worth recommending. Swedish. Okay, it's a Swedish romantic horror film. It's great. It's really good. It's really worth it. Horror is one of my favorite genres, and I hate almost every horror film, so. Uh, but yeah, I would recommend that. It's good. And if they did make a remake, I'd skip it, because... The fact that they need to remake every foreign horror movie that does somewhat well just drives me crazy. If they remake uh, the Korean one, I'm going to flip out. Another name asks, uh, what are my favorite movie genres? I watch weird movies generally. Um, a lot of classic movies. A lot of like European art films. Snobby bullshit. Um, like Polish cinema one of my favorites French uh, French surrealism um, I really like horror but again like I feel like most horror is so bad like stuff like Possession 1998 Andrzej Zulewski The Shining uh, Kubrick um, uh, Rosemary's Baby Polanski um, there used to be like real genuine like art film directors used to make horror and it used to be like Mm, so good not as much anymore the remake of Suspiria was really good I don't know if you guys have ever seen Suspiria it's a really cool Italian horror movie definitely not an art film but very very fun to watch um, and they recently remade that and I thought it was it was it was fairly good I thought the ending left a little bit to be desired but it was good good for what horror movies generally are uh what i might do one day in the future actually now that i'm on this topic i might make a, a video complaining about ari aster because ari aster just uh i i can't stand ari aster films like <sighs> midsummer was okay i guess but uh, hereditary was like one of just oh it drove me absolutely nuts but everybody loves ari aster and everybody loves hereditary so that's going to be one of my uh, cancelled takes, I'm sure. I'll do that and then I'll do my anti 
Neon Genesis Evangelion video and just alienate my entire audience in one swoop. Sorry, I rolled over my headphone cable there. Um, okay, it's your boy Skinny Penis is asking an important question, so I'm just going to finish up with the movie questions before we get on to that. Uh, Nicola asks, the remake has Chloe Mortez, which I like in what I see, I've see i seen here, but I haven't watched the remake in IRC. It's from a book. Okay. I didn't know that. Uh, there's a major difference in that the vampire... Oh, well, uh, is that spoilers? Rip. Um, Evangelion video, <laughs> please, unironically. Uh, uh, I feel like I... Like, I could... Uh, the, I guess the main problem I had with Evangelion is it was worked up too much for me. I didn't watch it when I was a kid. I didn't watch it when I was young. I watched it when I was an adult who heard it was like a very philosophical anime. So I was going into it like looking for Lane or Monster or uh, Mushishi, like something with like a little bit more philosophical content. And what I got was like mech fighting. And like I know, I know the mech fighting is like filler. I understand that there is stuff going on in the background. And that, um, like, the last couple episodes turn into this surrealist psychological exploration of, you know, coming of age and identity and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, um, like, I, I understand the point. Like, I understand why people liked it. I, I, I get it. I just feel like it didn't have enough philosophical content to me. Those last two episodes were just sort of this nice... Uh, it, it, Rice kind of run down on psychoanalysis. It, it was a nice little Freudian you know, discussion. It didn't really have all that deep of philosophical connections. But, um, yeah, see, a lot of people have told me that I need to watch the movies and keep going with it. And I was just like, oh my god. You're telling me, like, I got through 20-some-odd episodes of filler and, like, I'm still not even, like, <laughs> to the good stuff yet? Like, oy vey. But, yeah, so, whether I'm going to watch EOE and change my mind, I don't know. I'll leave that open. I'll leave that, that space open. But as far as the 26 series show goes, I think that the philosophical content, perhaps... Left a little bit to be desired. Uh, okay, so uh, it's your boy Skinny Penis asks, "What's your opinion on the George Floyd uh, protests? Uh, what also do you like Eraserhead?" Okay, so I guess I'll follow up on that Eraserhead. Eraserhead's an amazing movie. I really like Lynch. Lynch is one of my favorite directors, actually. Highly recommend Eraserhead if you want to just like hurt your brain hurt your sense of psychological continuity if you want to put yourself in a nice existential crisis go watch uh, Eraserhead it's a great movie so the protest going on with George Floyd I'm of somewhat of a conflicted mind F for one I think it's a it's an important and genuine expression of what's happening right now like I'm not Nothing that I'm about to say right now is in any way discounting the protests or trying to, uh, you know, wag my finger at people who are participating in them, right? But I think that protests and riots generally, like, they have a long history in capitalist society. This isn't the first time we've ever seen an uprising like this, right? I mean, you can look back to... Um, uh, the LA riots, the London riots. Um, the the trick is with a lot of those things, they don't tend to go much farther than just this raw expression of discontent, right? So a lot of that comes out in the sense of looting, right? That like they looted the target, and it became this huge thing of like, does looting this target like 
disqualify the protests or whatever like you know is there burning down buildings like does that disqualify them morally and i would say no i think it's way too simplistic to to do those sorts of things but at the same time the goal of the the protest shouldn't be to, to loot it shouldn't be to just burn things down not that that's not going to happen obviously or that that's wrong but that like that we need to resist using that as an outlet in itself right it's not necessarily a revolutionary act to steal things from target okay like even if that may be a genuine expression of revolutionary energy like those two things can can both be accepted right uh zizek gives a really good analysis of the london riots where he basically says that like this weird idea where like capitalist society starts to break down there is no state you know controlling the people anymore and it's like the people have no other option but to lapse back into consumerism like the only way they can process this they can't put their thoughts into words they can't express their demands so they settle for looting <laughs> and i think there is a danger there but at the same time like i think that the protests right now have certainly gone beyond that we, it's it's not just looting target stores right i mean they're tearing down barriers at the white house they're burning precincts it's much past uh it's it's much much farther past just this simple looting aspect so as as long as we can genuinely take that movement and funnel it into like a positive leftist project i am 100 percent for the protest i think it's great i think it's fantastic absolutely but again this isn't the first time this has happened in capitalist society it's very easy very easy for stuff like this to just turn into consumerist hedonism and then it turns into this moralistic right wing oh the people you know it, it, it basically uses it to defang the left wing that it, it, it since we don't have good theory yet of what to do in these situations we can be kind of co-opted by our capitalist ideology and end up playing directly into their hands that's what i wouldn't want to happen Have I seen Sans Soleil by Marquer? Um, no, I haven't actually. I've seen, um, oh, what was that short film? That wasn't Sans Soleil, was it? I can't remember the name of it now. Oh. Sorry, I'm gonna have to look this up. This is driving me crazy. Uh, La Jete, that's the one I watched. I haven't seen Sans Soleil, but I'll, I'll, I'll watch that too because I think he's a really a really important director. And I have been actually meaning to, to watch Sans Soleil ever since I watched La Jete. Uh, it's your boy Skinny Penis says, I think looting is kind of revolutionary in that you're sabotaging a capitalist machine and also taking products and decommodifying them and sharing them. Like, yeah, see, that's the thing. If you decommodify them and share them, that's that's one thing, but... I think, and and again, like I, this isn't to to try to blame anybody or say like what's happened. This is what's happening right now, right? But it's so easy to look at a video of somebody stealing a television and use that as like moral, like like that somehow that is necessary justification to discount the entire movement. And we really need to kind of be aware of how dangerous uh that that dynamic can be and it's not again it's not because the people are are deep down capitalists or they're deep down they all they want to do is con consume it's that we don't have even like the language to put our alienation into all we really have is these sorts of previous forms of rioting and and looting to 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 go by and i'm hoping that something a little bit more positive something a little bit more constructive will come out of it because most of those other riots didn't lead to large-scale societal changes. Watcher asks, how would it turn into a leftist project? Is there any guide or direction? How would the protest make the rich owners not uh, be not what they are? Um, well, I mean, this is the this is the million-dollar question. How do you turn it from just raw, it like like just these raw emotion like desire, right? It's it's to, to put it into losing Guattari terms right there's this huge amount of like 
desire that's being released can we funnel that through a political machine like a left-wing political machine right now we have nothing to funnel it there is no machine to funnel it through all we really have is this raw energy right and while that raw energy is like extremely potent and it's like making it's doing something if we can't actually have that if the re-territorializing side of that deterritorialization is just more capitalist right-wing top-down whatever maybe the riots didn't do what they were planning on you know or what they they aimed at so i think it's it's that step it's between taking these the, this desire these flows of desire and actually managing to put them into some form of leftist machine leftist social machine that can process those desires in a way to make real change what that would look like on the ground i have no idea and i mean i'm not even american i'm canadian so what, like take everything i say with a big grain of salt right i mean i'm i'm a foreigner it's your skinny boy penis says very consumerist so yeah i'm also kind of conflicted yeah but again I, I think it's only consumerist because we live in a capitalist society like it's this falling back on 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 ideologies um or put, it, it, I'm, I, I'm talking, I'm switching now back and forth rapidly between Zizek and Deleuze, which is probably the worst thing you can really do. But you can even think about it in the terms of that, uh, in Anti-Oedipus, there was the charts of desire. And you can see when the schizophrenic runs into the, the wall of capital, right? He can fall back into previous re-territorializations. And one of those re-territorializations is back onto the body of capital. And... So in, in a real way, like, just because there is a revolutionary force doesn't mean that revolutionary force is going to overcome the limit. Revolutionary forces are constantly being re-territorialized back into capitalist. Um, capitalist uh, re-territorializations -ter constantly. Like, this is the whole mechanism. So it's, it's we're, we're, we have this beautiful moment of possibility. And the last thing I would want is for people to get complacent or to start thinking that like that's enough that if 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 we burn and loot enough stuff that they're going to listen to us that's not the way it works we're going to need another step here we're going to need something positive something to funnel that energy into watcher says taking the commodities does not break from the idea that people are defined by what they have yeah exactly it's it's doesn't actually escape but again there's that weird idea of like like people are taking the commodities and redistributing them like handing them out or you know if you if you if you loot a target and you steal medical supplies which you then use to help you know uh protesters that's a completely different approach than to go out and say hey i have that chance to get that new tv i'm not able to afford like it's a completely different um uh ideological uh backing that might, might very well might justify um, the, the exact same action of breaking into a target and stealing stuff. So again, I think it's it's more about building these positive political projects than it is just wagging your finger or preemptively trying to say like the moral line has been crossed, give up. Like that sort of stuff is just so... Uh, it, it's it's hard to be able to to offer a critique without falling into that, right? To try to offer a positive critique to to shape this... In a, in a way that can benefit everybody without simply <laughs> turning it to somebody defending target like that's the last thing you want to be verma dog says could you do a video on deleuze's text on sasher mouse peppy tailing i haven't read that actually sasher uh I'm totally unfamiliar with that i could read it and if i enjoy it and understand it i could The board called it recuperation. Oh, okay. Yes, the skinny boy penis says, that's the whole thing, taking the desires of the masses and making them a real organized revolutionary force. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think we have a way to do that. Like, the only really models we have of that are from the 20th century, and they not only were total failures, but they ended up being, ca like, falling into capitalism anyway. So that's... That's the really hard part is we're stuck in the 21st century without any 21st century theories. Um, that's my take, at least. Uh, it's not a very helpful take, I guess, but that's my take on it. 
Watcher says nice, but handing out medicine from uh, taken from a shop is not a pipeline of production of said object. Me, no, for sure, for sure, absolutely. Um, but it's just that that way that um, like production, like I guess I I don't have like a positive productive model. I'm not a socialist, right? I'm not even pretending like oh we we need to put in like um, uh, worker co-ops and it's gonna solve everything. Like even I think that's too naive. So, I, yeah, I don't have a great answer here, unfortunately. Noah Watson says, to be honest, I think people are too pacified by tech and wealth to revolt in the first world. I think this is a big... It's true, yes, but at the same time, like, you could have probably said the same about Hong Kong. The, I don't think that revolutions come, or revolts necessarily, but especially revolutions come from society getting worse and worse and worse until it hits like a point where no one can stand it anymore it's more about this gap between expectations and reality it's when you can what's what's a good way to put this and again i'm drawing this all from zizek so i'm sure someone's heard this before but that like it's it's revolutions they don't break out when things are at their worst they break out when people have like a certain optimism for the future that gets dashed that is when uh, movements really happen. It's not that um, hundreds of, of people need to be, you know, ma murdered in the streets before we rise up. It takes one accidental killing of a black man by a police officer. I say accidental, you know, I'm giving him the best benefit of the doubt here for the sake of my argument here to set all this stuff off. It doesn't necessarily take society to, to degrade into a, a place of... of uh, you know you, that you can't live necessarily and i'd say there are a lot of places right that are far far worse off than hong kong or, or the united states right now that are nowhere near as close to a, a revolt or, or a revolution so I, it's 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 hard to to yeah it's hard to actually to 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 draw these lines because i think so much of it is untested in the 21st century we don't know like really what technology does for for riots and revolutions and revolts and protests we're starting to learn through the arab spring through the hong kong riots um it, the yellow jess vest protests like there are these new movements that are starting to take advantage of these things and 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 use them for their own means but yeah i, I genuinely like i think that's one of the big problems is we don't know it what, what it takes for the first world to revolt now that it has tech and, and this sort of wealth. It looks like it can, <laughs> for what it's worth. Another name says, reminded me of the amazing idea to do a video about Nix's writings. So what I'm probably going to do, because you guys have a few different ideas for videos to do, and they all seem pretty good, maybe I'll just disappear for a little while. I'll work on the Telio Plexi video. We'll rip that Band-Aid off. We'll get all that out of the way. And then, like, maybe I'll even do, like, a vote. We'll, we'll get a few ideas together and um, do a straw poll or something. I don't know. I guess what, while this is all happening, um, as in, like, me doing the Telioplexy video, I'm going to talk to my Patreons, and we will discuss exactly how to advance. <laughs> then I'll know more. Um, yeah. Uh let's see forbidden shuffler says i think elac is the best we have to deal with regards to 20th defense see like i feel like i'm such a bad leftist I, uh, at least that's the way i feel because like i am a leftist i do support the accelerationist um critique of what uh, modernity however you want to say it i don't think leftac has an answer here uh, not from what I've read, at least, like not coming out of Nick, Nick Srinik and and Williams, what, what, whatever their names are, like Alex Williams. I don't think they, that side of left act, act has an answer for this. Um, again, that, their sort of answer is the more socialist, you know, worker co-op um, unions reducing the amounts of work hours. Like, it's, it's all well and good, but I don't think it really has an answer to people out on the streets burning down police stations, right? Watcher says, you seem to support left, but you don't see yourself as a socialist, uh, as what do you see yourself, and you, and don't say descriptive theorist. Yeah, so, 
this is my take on it. I'm an incidental leftist. I'm an incidental leftist. So I have a degree in political um, science. I, I went into political science bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to learn about politics. And I came out of my degree in political science being more disillusioned towards politics than you ever possibly could imagine. So, like, to a large degree, I see myself as politically homeless. The reason why I say that I'm a leftist is because, incidentally, if you just want to tally up sort of what I believe in politically and what everybody else believes in politically, I'll end up on the left. Like, the left... The distinction between left and right, like if you actually look at where the term came from, it came from the French Revolution. So after they had the revolution, they got together in the gymnasium in the Paris of Versailles and they sat around and debated sort of like what the future of France would look like. So on the left hand side of the gymnasium sat the revolutionaries, the liberals, and on the right hand side of the gymnasium sat the monarchists, the, the conservatives. But, right, like, what can we actually draw out of that? Because obviously today, the right wing, there are plenty of right wing Republicans. There are plenty of right wing liberals. There are plenty of, like, to think that, like, you have to be a monarchist to be on the right wing is nonsensical. So what is it about that distinction that we really use, right? What are we drawing from when we say left and right? And to me, what it basically means is that the left are the people who want to change society. They look want to advanced society they're looking for new forms of society whereas the right is looking to conserve society to keep society the same to preserve the forms we have generally i think that's the best way to distinguish left and right and it certainly doesn't agree with a lot of other people's distinction of left and right but i mean as far as trying to not only like to to come up with a definition of left and right that actually makes sense when you use it Right. Like, I think that's the only really way to make sense, because as soon as you start bringing it down to like leftists or socialists, like, well, they certainly weren't when the term leftist was invented. Right. Like at, at that point, to be a Republican and a liberal, you were the most progressive left wing think thinker out there. Like to believe in in a, a liberal representative democracy, you were like a, a radical left winger. So I, again, I, I'm an incidental leftist. I'm a leftist because the things I support generally are in favor of, of reforming society. I don't think that uh, left and right are as useful of terms as people tend to make them out to be. And, and when they turn into useful terms, it's typically in places like America where it's a two party system where like the left wing has a party and the right wing has a party. But like in Canada, like, if you were to bring somebody like Biden or Hillary Clinton, like they are so far to the right. Like the idea that a right winger in Canada would like be against um, universal health care is like, it doesn't really happen. I mean, I'm sure they're out there somewhere, but in polite society, you don't argue against universal health care in Canada, regardless of what side of the, the aisle you're on. And I think part of that too is because on the right, you have the, this argument you to keep it the same, right? Like, the argument of preservation, the argument of conservation in Canada still involves the healthcare system because that's the way our society is set up. So that, that's, I think, more where I come from, from left and right. Um, I think the idea of like socialism as Marx, Engels, uh, Lenin, the whole sort of tradition has defined it. I think that has been proven from a Marxist historical determinist or historical um, a dialectical historical perspective is wrong. It didn't work. It failed. It turned into capitalism. Like China today is arguably the most effective managers of, of capital on the planet. So the idea that socialism as it was imagined in the 20th century is going to lead us away from capitalism, I think is idealistic. It's not materialistic. Uh, James White says it said that revolts happen when uh, breed gets too expensive. Oh, bread gets too expensive. Well, it's not what happened here. It had nothing to do with prices here or like economic um, issues. 
amazingly you'd think with all the economic issues going on that something would happen there but like the economic revolts were like occupy where they sat around and sung kumbaya i mean the real revolt happened through um a murder Uh, Watcher says other countries aren't anywhere near a uh, revolution. Well, I'm not sure if the West is either. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to make it too optimistic here. Um, but the idea that um, like revolutions scales with like um, like how bad your society is, I think that's not. It doesn't quite accurately like you can't you can't use that in any predictive way because it's not. There isn't like a line societies cross when they revolt. It's always these weird kind of self-reflective things that kind of spark out of nowhere. Um, sorry, I don't think I read the rest of your question. Uh, Watcher says, uh, but if it is, then probably because the universities and metapolitics are... Uh, and probably because the universities and metapolitics is allowed to be progressive. I mean, that could be a big part of it, yeah. Um, I would be interested to see uh, how much the sort of university the university line plays into it because like when I think of the more university protests it was Occupy it was the pussy hat protests those seem to be the more institutionalized protests which were totally impotent they didn't go anywhere Yeah, no, Watson. I'm not a monarchist. Monarchists uh, aren't good. <laughs> it's it's just that weird example of how you know right and left when they were originally used meant completely separate political beliefs than than we do, like almost opposite in a weird way. At least on the on the, the right wing um, uh, is what used to be the left wing. No one's really a monarchist anymore. The the what used to be the right wing is fucking gone for the most part. Forbidden Shuffler says incidental leftist is a nice label. Yeah, that's that's kind of the best I it's the best answer I have, really. If you if you put me on a political compass website, I'd come out on the left. That's that's pretty much the only reason I identify as a leftist. Just that general sort of like do you if you if you are looking to change society, you end up on the left side. If you're looking to keep society the same, you end up on the right side. Even if, you know, the people on the left and the people on the right end up totally not agreeing with one another. Noah Watson says, post-leftist? I don't know. I've heard the term post-leftist a lot in kind of conflicting ways. I don't have a good definition for it in my brain. I'd say possibly. Like, post-Marxist is a one that I hear a lot. And, like, I feel like that should... I feel like that should be a useful term. But then, like, when I excuse me when i try to look into it i just don't find that much useful like a, a actually useful uh identification in it there isn't that much there i don't know forbidden shuffler says I feel kind of the same although the i don't know if that's my uh chat glitching out or what one second, let me check the other chat. No, it just looks like the sentence got cut off. I'm not quite sure. Um, SRB says that face went too dumb for books. No, no one's too dumb for books. It just takes a lot of practice. Like, I genuinely think, like, when I was going to school, like, I wasn't the smartest person in the class. I would just, like, read a lot. <laughs> you, you definitely don't have to be the smartest person to be the person who's read the most, that's for sure. James White said it also didn't in Iran require bread to be too expensive. Yeah, yeah, Iran is a good example too, for sure, where um, you definitely can't just, like, like conditions were continually improving and improving and improving and improving, and then there was, like, a sudden, uh, like, break, not in necessarily conditions, but in, like, expectations of conditions, and that was, that was the bigger catalyst. Uh, James White also says, I can't think of a revolution before the 20th century that wasn't due to abject poverty. Um, 
I'm sure there would be. I'm trying to go through historical revolts in my head right now, and I'm not. I'm sure I'm not drawing as many as I could. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm drawing a blank on a good example here, so I'll hold that. I'll hold. Hold off on that, but I'll say like, I'd like to look into that more, because it would be interesting. On the other side of it, if we do see that that is a 20th century or, you know, a post 20th century phenomena, that would be really interesting. Watcher says, uh, I think university theories eventually determine the Overton window. Uh, in what sense the university enables what we see? The Overton window is, is a hard one, right? Like, I don't know if, if it's probably much more complicated that the Overton window in some way also suggests what you are even able to say in university so the overton window also provides its own sort of um, beginning sort of place uh, i don't know I, I don't know where i'm going with that but like it does seem like the overton window like although it might be affected by the universities it still also is quite important into like what you could even say in universities in the first place Forbidden Shuffler says, but post-Marxist is unmaterious as it goes. Yeah, it's still like, again, like post-Marxist, like, seems like a good label, but then I look into it and I'm kind of like, well, maybe not. But again, I, I'm not an expert on post-Marxism or post-leftism, so if anyone has any rebuttals, I'm happy to hear them. Forbidden Shuffler says, uh, do you know the YT channel Sad World? I don't. It's done by Noah Monk. Monk? Monk, probably Monk, uh, the guy who played Jibby, and I, I, did, I, I'm a boomer. I never watched iCarly. I don't know who Jibby is. He now does surrealist postmodern comedy. Oh boy, is it like Dreg? <laughs> Dredge? Dreg? Greg? I'm, I'm not the biggest Dredge, Dred, Dreg fan. Although I think he gets a little bit too much flack. I saw a video the other day of Vosh calling him out. I thought that was ridiculous. Yeah, I'll take a look into it, Forbidden Shuffler. I've definitely never heard of the channel, so I'll take a look. Uh, Noah Watson, what about the American Revolution? Oh, that was Yeah, there you go. I mean... It, arguably it had economic um like like slavery was a very important economic factor in the south a lot of people don't realize that like a lot of that wasn't necessarily moralistic as much as it was like that was how the south's economy operated at the time um obviously it's moralistic because slavery is immoral so you can't avoid that side of it but uh yeah i think there's probably a, an element there where um it certainly wasn't that like the conditions for the white slaveholders in the south got so bad that they decided they needed to revolt um let's see another name says what do you think of vosh i think vosh he's <laughs> like i appreciate being as vocal and active as he is i appreciate taking the fight you know to the other side and having conversations with people who you genuinely don't agree with but he has not read nearly enough political theory to be as confident in some of his beliefs as he is and like it's all well and good when he sticks to sociology but sometimes when he starts talking about marx and stuff like i just fucking roll my eyes i'm like and he admits it too that he hasn't read marx like it's not like it's a secret. It's just... Uh, anyways, there's there's videos Vosh did that I like, and there's videos Vosh did where I'm like, well, what the hell are you doing right now? <laughs> yeah, Vo like, Vosh, you can tell he, he understands, like, he has a degree in, was it sociology or something like that like when it comes to like 
uh, statistical analysis of you know inequality and stuff like that like he's googled all that stuff he has it all at his fingertips but um yeah when it comes to like actual political theory he's so so deeply underread on that side of it it tends to bite him in, in the ass sometimes i think Noah Watson says market socialism is a bit of a meme. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Like Vosh's whole idea of, of worker co-ops, I think is just so it's, it's that same kind of like, there's a lot of leftist approaches to sort of socialism that are, I feel anti-Marxist, not in the sense that Marx would have disagreed with them, but that if you want to take Marxist formula seriously, you can't really, you can't really give them all that much credit. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not a socialist is because like if you look at the sort of like historical progressions of history, like what happened when Marx wrote um, his work? Was there like a socialist revolution? Um, sure. Yeah. In several countries in the world, there was something at least calling itself a socialist revolution. But you want to know who the most uh, adept you know, figure at that time for putting in Marxism was, was fucking Bismarck. I mean, Bismarck was, he was suffering from um, these, like, uh, big uprising of socialists and communists, right? This was right around when Marx was writing. And there was this fear that, like, Germany could fall to the left. So how did he cut the legs out from under the socialists? How did he cut the legs out from under the communists? He put in workers' rights, he put in old age pensions, he put in child labor laws. He basically excised, you know, the socialist specter by putting it in. He went like, okay, well, we'll just give these people this sort of... If Marx is saying that it's this minimum sort of level of, of that capitalism can't support, and that's the reason why capitalism's going to lose, then why don't we as capitalists just give them that, that menial little safety net? And that menial little, you know, welfare safety net has supported capitalism ever since capitalism wouldn't have have survived the way it did if it wasn't for marx right like they deeply deeply brought you know the 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 analysis into the fold even if it was a sort of a in this weird negationary way of of as a way of of destroying the marxists right <laughs> How, what's what better way to to take away the the validity of marxists than to like literally just fix all the problems that they were having Oh, Marx was upset that children were being shoved down fucking chimneys, you know, at eight years old. Like, okay, child labor laws. Like, that hurts the left. That didn't actually help the, them to in their in their move towards destroying capitalism, right? So, and again, one of those reasons why left and left and right, uh, it's it's such a hard kind of policy because or such a hard kind of turn because when when. When Bismarck is implementing socialist policies, he's doing so specifically to keep society the way it is, specifically to keep capitalism functioning, to keep the the Prussian state on top. So it's yeah, it's it's a hard one for me at least to 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 deal with. Uh, James White, although the U.S. is a little different as it is a separate landmass, a little more like a war than a revolution. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, and I, I'm sure there are other examples too. Like, it's hard too, because like, the revolutions we have now in the 20th or that happened in the 20th century, like they just genuinely don't look like the ones that happened before. Um, and whether you can say that this is like it's a new type of revolution that we're we're a part of now in the post 20th century world or whether there's like more continuity there i don't know i'd i'd like to pick up a history book before i'd say more i guess <laughs> uh, i don't know if Foucault interviewed the shah of iran that'd be an interesting one to watch Noah Watson says, also, he just, oh, this would be Vosh. Vosh just calls people Nazis. Yeah, Vosh is really, really quick to call people a Nazi. And, like, the thing to me, right, again, like, from a political theory standpoint, is, like, fascism is one of the hardest terms to define in a political science classroom. Like, if that's your 
if you're in a political ideologies class and you're going over fascism, like, it's going to be a big, big fucking can of worms. Especially because, like, if you read, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. totally forgot what book I was going to bring up. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, anyways, screw it. It'll come to me. The Shaw No Khomeini. Oh, okay. Um... Light Arm Armanov, uh, what do you think of Negrostani's view that you can't sum the particulars to get the universal, and that his extension of the uh, to more than just a parallax? I feel like I haven't read enough Negrostani to comment here. I was actually uh, I was reading through some of Intelligence and Spirit with a couple other people, and. Um, yeah, it was a struggle. We certainly didn't get to his idea of um, particular and universals. So I feel like I just don't know enough about it to, to comment. Um, yeah, Negra Stan, there's a lot there. There's a lot there, and I just feel like I haven't quite wrapped my brain around it the whole way. Watcher says, if I Google Bismarck, the first result is not a man, but search results. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know what to say about that one. Is it really? I'm gonna look that up actually. Give me a sec. Huh. Yeah, you're totally right. Well, if you guys were, were curious there, I was talking about uh, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Otto, you are Leopold, Prince of Bismarck, Duke of Lauenburg. He's a uh, he's the guy f basically famous for popularizing real politique. Um, I think he's one of genuinely one of the most important political figures in in recent history for sure. But uh, we we might disagree on a few points. <laughs> Watcher says, in what sense would Greta Thunberg be left? Um. What's up to Greta Thunberg be left? I mean, I'm trying to to strictly stay to my definitions that I've been operating off of, like whether you're gonna change society. And I mean in that sense, like basically her her main point is like that we should listen to like um scientists rather than uh politicians which i mean like would actually be a bit of a change we do tend to like we we never actually read scientists we only read scientists when there's like someone quoting them in a news article <laughs> you know like um so in that sense i think thunberg is trying to like actually change society and that there's more expert um more direct sort of expert input onto some of these things but I mean, I guess you could, yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess from my side is like, I, it would be harder for me to argue that she's trying to keep society the same than it is that she's trying to change it. I mean, I guess she's trying to keep nature the same or like the environment the same, but I mean, I don't think that's necessarily what the left and right distinction was about during, um, during the French Revolution, at least. It's a skinny boy or fascism. I, I don't know where that quote came in from um uh or like what like what what that's what that's about the earth fascism quote um light armanov he mentions it on a talk on localization ramification and navigation uh okay okay so it's like it's it, is it on youtube then i'll, I'll definitely find it Another name says, do you think environmentalism is ultimately anti-ac? No. No. Okay, so 
I, I can understand why it would be very easy to say that in the sense that like I think capital is going to destroy the environment if you can put it like that um so in, in a sense environmentalism is anti act in the sense that I don't think I, I think accelerationism thinks that capital supersedes the environment as far as like intelligent historical processes go the problem with that is that like environmentalism still has the chance to like wipe all life off the face of the earth right and there's there's this kind of it's not a paradox it's the wrong word but basically in accelerationism there needs to be like a governor or like a, a compensation to acceleration if there wasn't a compensation to acceleration if there wasn't some sort of governor it would just blow up it would it would be no different than a bomb so environmentalism is needed to the point that like we can't kill ourselves <laughs> like so long as it works as sort of like a governing agent to make sure that like you know the plankton and the earth stay alive so we the oxygen doesn't disappear you know those kinds of broad uh, broad sort of existential threats that face human progress. I think that, yeah, it needs to be at least uh, understood be to, to keep that compensatory element working. But I, I think most environmentalists wouldn't be accelerationists. Like, I think that's a pretty hard uh, hard line to, to draw. In fact, the the one person I'm trying to think of who actually almost went this way it's that not because he actually wasn't really an accelerationist at all it was the guy who did the uh the mosque shooting and did that the manifesto because most of that manifesto was actually about eco-fascism it was actually about um eco-terrorism and and, and eco-fascism and then he happened to use the word accelerationism in the manifesto once so that's that's the closest i can think to like someone who's explicitly done it at least um and that was just a total meme so i i, I don't know Uh, Watcher asks, so is left neither tied to amount of authority nor Marx? No, not in my eyes. I mean, the left and right distinction definitely existed before Marx, so we can't reduce it to, to just Marx. Um, and I don't think it's tied to the amount of authority either. I think authority, it plays into it, right? The people that want to keep things the same generally have the most stake in sort of the, the ruling system. So, yeah, there's probably an interplay there. But I, like, I don't think you can reduce left or right to simply like matters of Marxism or authoritarianism or, or what. Noah Watson says, I think deep ecology is anti-act, but environmentalism is generally seen today as certainly act. Yeah, there's a weird, there's a very weird side to like accelerationism today. And that's actually a really good note to actually draw it against deep ecology. Because like deep ecology is about getting back into sort of like a... a harmonious under like relationship with nature so sounds very uh, decelerationist most excel like environmentalism today is like um oh let's see like global warming is like eroding the 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 shores the, the beach um the beaches you know how are we going to prevent that we're going to construct a massive steel barrier out, out on the water that will restrict the amount of of tides coming in or like you know it's it's these crazy technological like man-made uh geo uh what do you call it um like when you when you when you restructure the earth like geo geo formation um something about that strikes me as so accelerationist right that like oh um should we like reduce the amount of like pollution like no we just need to figure out a way that we can continue to pump out this amount of pollution and create some crazy technological solution that will like prevent the earth from doing what it's supposed to do like so much of environmentalism comes down to that and that's that's a very accelerationist uh, gaia forming yeah something like that. very accelerationist uh, approach angie m says angie m sorry if I, i'm probably pronouncing so many people's names wrong i'm sorry uh what do you think of the latent possibilities that the left has not explored in heidegger's thought Ooh. Ooh, that's a big one. I 
I I feel like I, I read so much Heidegger and I just never know what he's talking about. I studied under a Heideggerian professor who was actually considerably like one of the more left-wing environmentalist type people. He was very Heideggerian. Um, he had a lot of readings of, of sort of the left-wing Heidegger. I still have such trouble when I actually pick up Heidegger and try to try to read it though. Try to read like the things people tell me Heidegger means back into Heidegger. I find that so hard sometimes. Um, I'm sure there are definitely latent possibilities there that need to be explored, especially because Heidegger is still so under, like he's untapped. There is so much of Heidegger's thought that people simply haven't, uh, it hasn't been digested into sort of like mainstream political or even philosophical consciousness yet. Um, plus there's all the controversies with the black notebooks and stuff, which I'm sure are going to continue. So whether that's going to even change anytime soon, I don't know. Light green is to act is this light green is to act as the same as social democracy is to capitalism kind of. If light green is this um, like the sort of compensatory element of like techno techno capital engineering solutions to try to like avoid problems of the earth or like natural problems, then yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, Watson says, I think left and right today are pretty much just different ideological uh, accommodations of liberalism and not different philosophies. Uh, I mean, I think to a large degree that might be true just because, like, whether you want to change society or not, largely today comes down to, like, whether you want to do liberalism or not. And, um, like, I think, like, on the left, there are a lot of people who are sort of unwittingly right because they want to do more liberalism and there are probably a lot of people on the right who are sort of incidentally left because they want to tear that down um but again like i feel like left and writers they're such they have such loose descriptive value like it's doesn't really tell you much about somebody to know whether they're left or right in my opinion i mean it can't like in, in somewhere like the united states it does because there are only two parties so if you're a left winger, you vote Democrat. If you're a right winger, you vote Republican. Like, you have policies that they like subscribe to you as like a left winger and a right winger. I I don't see like the general sort of usage of the terms though as fitting into that sort of like more specific American um, sort of colloquial definition of left and right that people tend to like all over the place, all, all over the world tend to assume. Watcher says, well, I think Zizek has some line about not acting uh, at all is action. But Heidegger also has a chill down message. Uh, Zizek, yeah, he does believe that, like, not acting is an action in the sense that, like, you are kind of doomed to action for sure. But he, Zizek also isn't one of those people who just thinks that you should go out and act. He's very much against that idea of um, sort of like unrestrained praxis. He's very much like sit down and think for a very long time before uh, before coming up with a, a plan of action. Um, and Heidegger, Heidegger also has kind of that opposite of the chill down message because like when you start getting into like being towards death and like the more existential side of everything, there becomes like this very finite very finite amount of time that's like placed upon you right like you're ticking down towards your death in that sense and like that in a way like heidegger from that side of heidegger he's one of the most like go out there and do stuff kind of <laughs> philosophers to me like get things done because like you can't you can't be a heideggerian unless you're constantly like remembering like oh shit yeah i'm gonna die i will be dead and there will be like my project is temporal it exists in this this moment and I, if i if i don't make the most of this moment then the, the project will never come to be because my death will will reach me first
Elaine Aramov says, Enviro is an anti-ac. David Thomas has a good quote in the essay on feedback and cybernetics. It basically says that cybernetics is designed for non-human Enviro cybernetics, terminal Enviro solutions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's it's not as easy of a question, the environmentalism and, and ac relationship. And Nick Land just trolls here, basically. Someone asked him once if he believes in global warming, and he said that he doesn't believe in global warming, but if he did, that he would support it. So, I mean, like... It, whatever i mean like who knows i'm sure there's like there's some great papers to be written and i haven't read david thomas's essay so i'd like to check that out nikolai says i bought a book called final fantasy and philosophy <laughs> oh boy final fantasy takes a strong opinion on earthly is good and that the planets are organisms in the whole and such okay i don't know much about the final fan like i played a few final fantasy games but as far as like the overarching story between those i have no fucking clue Play, most of my Final Fantasy time has been put into like Final Fantasies like two and <laughs> one and two and stuff like that. I, so I don't know, but that sounds like an interesting book. I'd, I'd be interesting. I don't know if I'd buy it, but I'd be interested to hear what they what the take on it is. Okay, so um don't have all that much else to say I don't think if anybody has any more questions or anything feel free to throw it in the chat there um, this might be the last time you hear my voice for a little while I might be disappearing uh, to work on um, the uh, part three teleoplexy video so um, yeah I guess this is but goodbye for a short time uh, I'm going to follow up with my Patreons too about doing a Discord server uh, revamp, making it bigger and more accessible and whatever. Um, and if you guys want to chat with me, if you have any questions or if you just want to get into that uh, uh, Discord server to try to uh, make your case for why um, you should be able to get in it without <laughs> contributing to the Discord, I guess, uh, or Patreon, contribute to the Patreon. Uh, yeah, thanks again, everybody. Uh, it's just, I, I, really, thank you guys. I, I just, I feel really grateful to be able to, to come on here and rant about stuff and actually have people view it. It means a lot to me. And, um, yeah, I'm going to be working hard on the next video for you guys. We'll do, we'll do a premiere. We'll get together. It'll, it'll be a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that'll be the next time I see you. Have a good one.